let us stand and sing our opening song, which is I Am the Thinker. I'm going to start up our drum machine here. thinker who thinks the thought that changes things that shape my life. I am the thinker who thinks the thought I have the power to change my life. And if you, you ask, ask me who, who I am, am, I am wisdom, I am light, I am more than meets the eye, I cannot be defined. that changes things that shape my life. I am the thinker who thinks the thought I have the power to change my life. And if you ask me what am I, I am beauty, I am joy, I am more than meets the eye, I cannot be defined. changes things that shape my life. I am the thinker who thinks the thought I have the power to change my life. I can choose to, to be the light to frighten someone's darkest night. I'm much more than meets the eye. I cannot be defined. Thinker who thinks the thought that changes things that shape my life. I am the thinker who thinks the thought I have the power to change my life. I have the power to change my life. I have the power to change my life. Oh, no, I'm not Marianne Akers. Unfortunately, she's home like a lot of, one for, well, let's start with, yes, everybody, welcome to Sonora's Center Desert for Spiritual Living, and we're glad you're here. So I heard a lot of people had hail and storm and rain and their homes were damaged and windows and whatever, and so, so we're, we're glad you're here. And unfortunately, the Marianne had damaged her home and the person that's going to do work is presently at her house, help, helping her out. So. It's backup day. <laughs> so, my name is Bruce Kreck. On behalf of, on behalf of Reverend Donna Maurer and the Board of Trustees, I'm privileged to welcome you to the Sonora Desert Center of Spiritual Living. Whoever you are, wherever you are on your spiritual path, here you're truly welcome. Here you'll be validated, supported, and encouraged to be all that you're meant to be. Our vision statement is love in action every day in every way. We express this love by learning and living the principles of the science mind. you find our declaration of principles on the back of the program. Please join me now and read, read, read along with me. Please. I believe there is an infinite, infinite intelligence, intelligence operating, operating throughout the universe. universe. I believe this intelligent power is only good. I believe this intelligence expresses as me. I believe through my conscious use of this power, I create my life as happy, healthy, and complete. And so it is. Again, I'd like to thank you all for making this service a beautiful service because you're here to start with. It's wonderful. And having you present makes the day better anyway. So let's go to, oh, we, have any, we don't have any first visitor. Welcome back, Don and Lynn. Yay. Yay. At least they found their way home. <laughs> 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 it's good to have you back. Susan, oh, Susan, Susan. Yeah. oh yeah, Susan too, yes. <laughs> Welcome back, Susan. Hope you had a good time in Washington. It was a wonderful, beautiful place. 
His direct attention to the announcement. We, love, we are pleased to have Vicki Smith as our guest artist today. Always thank good you, to have thank you. Thank you. Always a privilege. And if you get a chance to see Vicki and Rick on a, a concert, it'd be also it's also very entertaining. Also, it's really great. Good morning. My name is Rosie and I'm your practitioner today. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's on the program. <laughs> anyway, so Rosie was not feeling very good today, so I'm filling in for her. Um, first thing I'm going to do is light the service candle, just knowing that we each have a light within us and that's where our lights are going to be joined today together in this service. So, just get comfortable and just know that there is one presence, one power, and I call it God. God is simply all there is. This power and presence is in all and is all. I acknowledge that we are all one with this power and presence that this present lives and moves and has its being within each one of us, here today and always. And I affirm this morning that we are each right where we are meant to be. I affirm that this service is unfolding just as it is meant to be. I know that there are blessings for Reverend Donna for each one of us here today, and I know that Reverend Donna will inspire us with her words. We anchor this by saying, and, and so, so it, it is. is. So the practitioners are the praying arm of the church. So if you have something, someone you want to pray for, please fill out a card over there and leave it in the prayer box. And we, as the practitioners, we put them out to everybody, to all the other practitioners, and we'll pray for you all week. Also, if you're not on our birthday list and you would like to be, there's cards over there and just fill out, put your birthday on it, your name. I got one with a name, no last name, and no address. So if that was you, please, <laughs> please help. <laughs> anyway, and the address where you're going to be when you have your birthday. So today, my reading is, it's out of the book by Ernest Holmes, How to Change Your Life. And this topic says a spiritual system. The, un the universe in which we live is a spiritual system governed by laws of mind. There are not two minds. There is but one mind, which is God. The outpush of the mind of God through the human mind is the self-realization of spirit, seeking a new outlet for its own expression. 
Ideas come from the great mind and operate through the human mind. The two are one. In this way, the infinite mind is personal to each individual. From the infinite self-knowingness of God, our power to know arises because our mind springs from the universal mind. In this way, the infinite multiplies itself through the finite. The science of mind teaches that God is personal and personal in a unique sense to everyone. It teaches that conscious communion with the indwelling spirit opens the avenues of intuition and provides a new starting point for the creative power of the Almighty. We can give only what we have. The only shadow that we cast is the shadow of the self. This shadow lengthens as we realize the great presence in which we live, move, and have our being. The science of mind not only emphasizes this unity of God and humankind, it teaches us, in that, us that in such degree as our thought becomes spiritualized, it actually manifests the power of God. In doing this, it literally follows the teaching of Jesus when he proclaimed that all things are possible to the person who believes. Namaste. Namaste. So I take this candle and I hold the high watch for each and every one here physically and those who couldn't be here today. Thank you. So this is a, a, a Christian song of hope. So it, it's an old, very old song. Um, Septimus Winner wrote it in 1868. So you, some of you might know the words. <laughs> it's been around a long time, so it's called Whispering Hope. Soft as the voice of an angel breathing a lesson on her. Hope with a gentle persuasion whispers her comforting word. Wait till the darkness is over. Wait till the tempest is done. For the sunshine tomorrow After the darkness is gone Whispering hope Oh, how welcome that voice Making my heart In its song the deepening darkness bright in the glittering star then when the night is upon us why should the heart sink away when the dark midnight is over watch for the break Continuing our, our theme of uh, strange topics and powerful lessons.
And, uh, and today's strange topic is befriending the bones. And, um, and the title comes from uh, chapter six in the book, The Second Half of Life by Angelus Arian. Um, she was a Basque American cultural anthropologist, an educator, author, lecturer, and consultant. But what I love most about her work is that she interweaves the spirituality of indigenous cultures with our own so that we can see how maybe incorporating um, a Native American tradition or a South Asian tradition um, into our own spiritual practice might make a difference in our lives. Um, in fact, I really did a series on her, on her entire book a few years ago, um, but I wanted a strange topic, and that's what I found in Chapter 6. But if you think about it, you and I are the forerunners of an entirely different lifestyle from our parents and grandparents. You know, we're living on the average 34 years longer. <laughs> so we really have an additional second adult lifetime. You know, it was when my grandparents were, were alive. I mean, basically, you retired at 65 and you were dead by 70, you know? <laughs> so you had a few years to enjoy it. But here we're living till 90, 100, 102. And what are we gonna do in that 35 or 40 years? <laughs> and we have, to, we have to look at that. We have to look at that and say, how can we be those change agents for a brand new lifestyle? Um, <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'm thinking. That's what you're thinking? Me too, me too. <laughs> because we might be retired from, from uh, a job or a profession, but we are active. Look at all of us. We're, we're active. We're finding purpose. We're finding ways to serve, um, ways for our life to have meaning. Um, it goes long after that golden retirement age of 65. So our quest becomes how do we live our life so that these years are the most important, the most fulfilled, and the happiest time of our life. Um, and if we dip into the knowledge of some of the native peoples, we find some of the answers that we're looking for. In, uh, in that book, that, I mean, the second ha half of life, Dr. Arian defines eight gates that we have to go through to move into that, that, that place where we are living in complete uh, authenticity and really loving our life. And so the sixth chapter is called The Bone Gate. And she says that the bone gate brings us to the bones of who we truly are, which is a metaphor for our authentic self. This gate strips away and shreds what is disingenuous in our nature and urges us to develop character, integrity, and wisdom. And at each gate, we have a task, and the task at the bone gate is to embody our authentic self. It's here that we summon the courage to risk telling the truth about who we are and who we are not. And Dr. Arian says the primary question at this gate are how and why do we avoid being who we truly are? You know, what gets in the way of trusting ourselves completely? You know, under what circumstances do we deceive ourselves? You know, answering these questions help us develop the self-regard to be true to who we are, unwilling to compromise our integrity in order to satisfy the expectations of others or win their approval. Um, she says, we can check ourselves by asking whether our motivation, speech, appearance, and actions match our true character. When our words and actions are in harmony, Wisdom, character, and authenticity emerge. Authenticity is the degree to which we are true to our, our own personality, our own spirit or character, despite the pressures that, are, that influence us and are all around us. Dr. Arian says we can accomplish nothing meaningful during the second half of life unless we reconnect our search for happiness with values that support our character and moral fiber. Only then can we assume the mantle of the elder and become a resource of compassion, <clears throat> insight, and clarity. Mahatma Gandhi was invited to speak before the House of Commons in England, and using no notes, he spoke for two hours and brought an essentially hostile audience 
to a rousing standing ovation. Following his speech, some reporters approached his secretary, incredulous that Gandhi could memorize his audience for such a long time with no notes. And his secretary responded, what Gandhi thinks, what he feels, what he says, and what he does are all the same. He does not need notes. You and I, we think one thing, feel another, say a third, and do a fourth, so we need notes and files to keep track. <laughs> So Gandhi's an example of the spirituality in action, totally congruent within himself and with the principles he stood for. And that's why he could say with confidence, my life is an indivisible whole and all my activities run into one another. My life is my message. I think that's one of the greatest, greatest statements on the planet, if we could actually say, my life is my message. You know, but Gandhi could say it with, with pure, um, pure, um, understanding. So, businessman and author Stephen Covey says, <clears throat> people who are congruent act in harmony with their deepest values and beliefs. They walk their talk. When they feel they ought to do something, they do it. They're not driven by extrinsic forces, including the opinions of others or the expediency of the moment. So, according to Dr. Arian's research of indigenous, indigenous people, it is told that in order to return to our true nature or our, our authenticity, we have to befriend four essential symbolic bones in our body. So that's why we got befriending the bones is our topic. <laughs> and so I want to take a look at them real quick and how we can befriend them, how they can lead the way for our own authenticity and congruency in our lives. The backbone, that's the quality of courage to stand by one's heart or core. The wishbone, that's the quality of hope, to stay open to dreams, blessings, and possibilities. And the funny bone, and that's the quality of humor, to foster joy and maintain flexibility. And the hollow bone, the quality of trust, to maintain openness, curiosity, and faith. Now, I just read an interesting story you know, I'm mean, thinking about backbone, the, the, um, the quality of courage. And I want to share it because I, I really, I, I didn't know this and I was really uh, um, taken aback. Um, there were three ships around this sinking ship when the distress signal was being sent. The first one, Samson, was approximately seven miles away from the sinking ship. Only seven miles. They could actually see it but they turned their backs because the crew aboard the ship had been involved in illegal hunting of seals. They turned their backs to a shipwreck because they didn't want to get caught. So sometimes courage is not about insane bravery. It's just simply about having the guts to let go of what's important to you in order to do what's right. There was another ship approximately 14 miles away from our sinking ship. The Californian saw the distress signal as, as it was within eye shot, but they were surrounded by ice and it was night and it wasn't comfortable for them to move, so they decided to wait till the morning for conditions to improve. And the third ship was approximately 58 miles away and was already moving in the opposite direction when they heard the cries over the radio and they decided to be that lifeboat. The captain of the ship just prayed to God for direction and turned his boat. They waded ice fields in the dark but kept going. The lifeboat, this lifeboat was named Carpathia, Carpathia and the shipwreck it sailed to was the Titanic. They saved 705 lives that night and they were saved because one man chose the right over the easy. One man had the courage to look beyond his comfort. His name is Captain Arthur Rostron, the man who simply said, Mr. Dean, turn the ship around. We'll never have to come to the aid of a sinking ship, uh, but we can choose right over easy, you know. Courage is standing by one's heart and doing what's right. We might not save 700 people, but we'll be able to go to sleep at night. <laughs> I wonder about those people in those other boats, you know. 
And Nias Nin says, life shrinks or expands to one, in proportion to one's courage. And John Wayne said, courage is being afraid and saddling up anyway. So I don't believe that courage is an inherent quality that we have or don't have, that we're born with. Rather, it's a practice. It's a choice that we make a thousand times a day, even if we don't realize it. You and I are practicing courage when we choose to show up and be real, when we choose to be honest, when we choose our le to let ourselves be truly seen. And whether we choose from courage or from safety is whether our life expands or shrinks. And the next bone is the wishbone. And that bone, the wishbone is that part of us that allows us to stay open to our dreams, blessings, and possibilities. Our founder, Dr. Holmes, says nobody grows old by merely living a number of years. People grow old only by deserting their ideals. Years may wrinkle the skin, but to give up interest wrinkles the soul. Whatever your years, there is in every being's heart the love of wonder, the undaunted challenge of events, the unfailing childlike appetite for what is next, and the joy of the game of life. You know, I, I've told you before about it, my practitioner that I had for many years. She was actually Ernest Holmes' practitioner, too. Um, but she was a lovely woman. I took practitioner courses from her, and, uh, and she was my private practitioner. I went to her whenever I needed help. <laughs> um, but uh, she, she passed away at age 102, 102. And three days before she passed away, she was teaching a class. So, <laughs> and we've all heard stories about that. We were, you know, when we're interested, when we're open to the blessings that life is giving us, even with diminished abilities, life's an adventure. <laughs> the Tura had osteoporosis so bad that she was completely stooped over, completely. But that didn't stop her from seeing life as a joyful adventure. And so... <laughs> I want to be like Vatura when I'm 102. <laughs> Joseph Campbell tells us to follow our bliss. Our bliss is that which brings interest, adventure, and vitality to our soul. If we have an interest we've put on the back board burner, it isn't too late to renew it. And one of the beautiful things about living in this area is that if you do have an interest that you want to pursue, chances are some, somebody, someplace, somewhere has got a class or a group of people that are doing just what you want to do. So <laughs> <clears throat> Investigative journalist George Monbiant said, despair is the state we fall into when our imagination fails when we have no story that explains the present and describes the future, hope evaporates. And I think it is our wishbone that holds the story together, the story we tell about ourselves. And when our story has imagination, when our story is open to the possibilities that are all around us, then despair turns to hope, and hope opens the floodgates of those possibilities. And that is not contingent upon age. Our founder, er, our founder said that youth is not entirely a time of life. It is a state of mind. It's not wholly a matter of right cheeks, red lips, or supple knees. It's a temper of the will, a quality of the imagination, a vigor of the emotions, a freshness of the deep springs of life. It means a temperamental predominance of courage over timidity, of an appetite for adventure over love of ease. Let me go on to funny bone, and that's a symbol of our sense of humor. Um, it fosters joy and maintains flexibility. <clears throat> you know, the word humor has its root meaning, meaning as moisture. <clears throat> and in fact, Wikipedia says the origin, origin of the term derives from the humoral medicine of ancient Greeks, which stated that a mix of fluids known as humors controlled human health and emotion. Moisture in our body keeps our body flexible, and a sense of humor keeps our character and authenticity resilient and flexible. 
Ernest Holmes said, our experience is filled with laughter and tears, singing, dancing, praying, and exalting, and sometimes falling into the depths of despair. We need to have a good-natured flexibility toward all that we encounter, not fighting against life, but cooperating with it. Thanks, Susan. Appreciate that. <clears throat> and Ernest left those words. I did not know him personally. But uh, I knew a lot of people that did know him personally. And one of the, <clears throat> one of the beautiful things I used to, to love is we would close the office from about 4.30 or 5, and then we'd open up about, about 6 for classes. And so we would sit there. there was Carol Hatch was the administrative assistant, and I was the secretary. And Dr. Hornaday, who was, who was really the man that, that Ernest Holmes said, this man will take my place. Um, and he would tell stories. And it would really, he had such, Ernest Holmes had such a sense of humor. And he loved weeds, and he didn't care who he invited for dinner. It could be a big shot. But he would have a bouquet of weeds <laughs> on his table because he said, weeds are flowers, too. We just, we've just named them wrong. And he would do things like that. I mean, he would just really, uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember, I remember that one of the stories, um, they, were playing, they were playing horseshoe, and sometimes they did that in the afternoon. Um, the people that worked in the, around the offices, and somebody was standing behind him, and he went like this and let it go. <laughs> I think it was Reginald Armour, and Reginald grabbed his stomach, and, and he said, what are you doing standing behind somebody with a horseshoe, especially if it's me? <laughs> so he would just, he really did love life, and you could tell it. He would, stand, he would sit on this uh, stoop in front of the um, uh, building, the, the office building, and talk to whoever came by. And if somebody needed some help, there was a little box of money in the, in, the, in the church library that he would help people out. So that's the kind of man he was. So we're really lucky to have this kind of a, a guy who is the, um, um, the person that we're following as, as a leader. Um, you know, and, and, and again, with, with humor. <laughs> um, when I came to Florida, it was to take over a church um, the minister there, Eleanor O'Malley, uh, she had macular degeneration and she was going blind. And she basically became fully blind in the, in, while I was there and had to give up driving and everything, um, which I'm glad. <laughs> Watch somebody drive like this <laughs> because, because she had no central, she was only peripheral. So. Um, but she. I mean, this wasn't something she was born with. This is something that happened to her over time. And yet, she took it with the most grace and humor of any person I have ever met in my entire life. Um, instead of wallowing in self-pity when they gave her the, said, you know, <laughs> give up your car and everything, she got herself a seeing eye dog named Joni beautiful yellow lab, and uh, she continued to do things for herself. But then she always had a story to relate. You know, she was waiting for a ride um, when a car slowed down and stopped. <laughs> Thinking it was for her, she opened the door and, and hopped in, and the man at the, drive, at the wheel said, I don't want you. <laughs> and she said, well, I don't want you either. <laughs> so she got out and slammed the door. <laughs> And one time she said to me, she said, you know, when you open a can of something you thought you bought, you can have a very interesting meal. <laughs> but she was able to go through this with such grace. Um, and she did it by maintaining a sense of humor. Um, she had been a massage therapist prior uh, to becoming a minister. And she and Joni were welcome guests at the hospice where Eleanor would give massages to the patients. And Joni always got some sort of a little, a little present from most of the people that they visited. Um, so she was indeed a role model for me and, and now for all of us in our second half or third chapter of life, you know. Um, you and I have things all around us that remind us to laugh. 
you know, John and I were giggling yesterday because there was a lizard outside the, the sliding door and my cat was behind the, behind the, the curtain, you know, fixed on this lizard. And we couldn't really see her, but we could see her shadow, you know, like this. <laughs> and it was just so cute because there's no way she could catch it. But she didn't know that, or if she did, she wasn't going to tell anybody. <laughs> And I love the quail. I mean, I think that God made quail for us to laugh. There's no, there's no way that you can watch a, a, a covey of quail and, and, not, and not giggle. Um, so our job is to find those little areas. Keep our sense of humor honed. You know, that's a, that's a good, that funny bone is a good bone to keep sharp and, and smart. And then the last one is a little hollow bone. And, and Angela Sarian said that this bone allows us to be open to the mystery of life and allows that mystery to work us rather than us working the, minis- the mi- mystery. Um, she says that the Appalachian mountain people who meet each other on the road will often ask, what's learning you? Or what's working you? <laughs> so the hollow little bone reminds us that the mystery is learning us and working us rather than the other way around. And we're all, we're all such control freaks. That's a, that's a good <laughs> note to, to, to end on, kind of, because um, the idea that we can give up not knowing everything, that we can just stay with that mystery and just be enchanted by it. Um, we all, because we always, you know, most of us jump to conclusions and we want to find answer, answers as quickly as possible. Um, but life doesn't work that way, you know. Sometimes we need to let the mystery work us, and sometimes we need to stay with the questions, as uh, Rainier, uh, Maria Rilke said so perfectly. He said, be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. So as we li- live everything, the mystery comes alive for us. You know, everything, everything is an opening to divinity if we just wait for it. <laughs> it will happen. Trappic, uh, Tra- Trappist monk and mystic Thomas Merton wrote, life consists in learning to live on one's own spontaneous on one's own spontaneous freewheeling. To do this, one must recognize what is one's own, be familiar and at home with oneself. This means basically learning who one is and learning what one has to offer to the contemporary world and then learning how to make that offer valid. So as you and I befriend our backbone of courage, our wishbone of dreams, our funny bone of lightness and joy, and our hollow bone as the mystery of our being, then we too are at home with ourselves. And that which is our authentic, true self is our valid offering to the world. Thank you, namaste. Thank you. So Vicki and I were up to no good for you all this week. <laughs> so, anybody know, uh, you know, foot bones connected to the hip bone, right? We've got... That's right. We changed it, all right. We, got, we now have a new thought version based right off of the talk today. And we're connecting all those bones. <laughs> so, let's get, a, let's get a, a, a little drum beat going for this here. I think that'd be fun. Trying to get something here. What happened? What happened to our volume? Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh, you know why? Because I didn't turn it on. <laughs> Isn't that the way it always goes, though? Yeah. All the technology we use here, huh? Eh? Oh, there we go. What do you think? Thank 
connected to the backbone. The backbone's connected to the arm bone. Arm bone's connected to the hand bone. Together we are one. Hope is connected to the wishbone. Wishbone's connected to the collarbone. Collarbone's connected to the rib bones. Together we are one. Humor is connected to the funny bone. Funny bone's connected to the joy bone. Joy bone's connected to the love bone. Together we are one. Trust is connected to the hollow bone. The hollow bone channels to the courage bone. The courage bone's connected to the backbone. Together we are one. Courage is connected to the backbone. Backbone's connected to the arm bone. Arm bone's connected to the hand bone. Together we are one. Hope is connected to the wishbone. The wishbone's connected to the collarbone. The collarbone's connected to the rib bone. Together we are one. Humor is connected to the funny bone. The funny bone's connected to the joy bone. The joy bone's connected to the love bone. Together we are one. Trust is connected to the hollow bone. The hollow bone's connected to the courage bone. The courage bone's connected to the backbone. Together we are one. <laughs> That's right. Fun. So what do you guys think? Did we do Love okay? it. <laughs> That's a keeper. That's a keeper. <laughs> Can you imagine anybody walking in on us? <laughs> and say, so that's a fun group, Donna. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but I love it, and I thank you so much for doing that. That's, that, sounded like a, that sounded like a fun afternoon. I wish I were, I were there. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, um, time for our offering. And now uh, this is time to, to put that uh, energy in place that allows this divine circulation to go out from us and come back to us. Um, so if you'll join me on the offering affirmation. My, My gift, gift goes, goes forth, forth to heal, heal prosper, and, and bless all, all that it touches. It is evidence of my conviction that God is the source and substance of my supply. I share generously of my good, knowing that it returns to me multiplied abundantly, and so it is. Of your fellow man, lend him a helping hand, put a little love in your heart. You see, it's getting late, oh, please, please don't hesitate, put a little love in your heart, and the world will be a better place, and the world will be a better place for you and me just wait and see a little love in your heart put a little love in your heart put a little love in your heart so much and thank you um, for all the blessings that you give us <laughs> um, I received a little note from Peggy Bailey on Friday 
And she, in this little card, she had something that she had, I didn't bring it today, I should have, but she had something that she had written about the center and how much it meant to her back in 2010. So, <laughs> so that just kind of, kind of made my eyes leak. <laughs> so, so let's just take a moment to close this portion out in prayer, and then I see there's all kinds of yummy goodies back there. So yeah, Susan said, and thank you. It's good to have you back, my darling. So, <laughs> so right now I'm just knowing that there is one mind, one life, one power, and that power includes those four bones, those beautiful bones of courage and wisdom, of humor, of mystery. And I know that these are all what makes us who wouldn't, what we are. And as we learn along with the ind indigenous people, to befriend those bones, we become more of who we truly are. So I know that that is our blessing, and I know that there is a blessing for each and every person here today and those who would be here. Special words for Mary Ann, and uh, um, John Lopez took a spill in the, in the ice, so, uh, we just pray for quick recovery for him. Um, and for anyone else who's experiencing any kind of a challenge in those areas that are war-torn and devastated, to know that even in the midst of that, God is there, healing is taking place, and love surrounds everyone. So I just give thanks that we're here today and that we can speak our word for ourselves and each other and the world and know that something is happening as we do. And I just say, anchor this by saying, and so it is. Thank you so much. Can we stand and form a circle and sing stand? Peace. 